Hi, good afternoon. Uh, yeah, that's a, a good indication of some integration there. Uh, two government scientists from different parts of uh, Environment Canada uh, sharing a talk for, the, for this one. So we, we both are going to cover some aspects of this, this work on atmospheric deposition. So we're back now into really the atmosphere and what's emitted, where it's going. And um, this is work that uh, is, is done in, in both of these uh, parts of Environment Canada. I'm from the atmospheric side. Uh, much of it's been conducted and led by Dr. Tom Harner there as part of the list of the authors. Also Jean-Pierre Charlon and the, the groups at our Environmental Technology Centre in Ottawa where we have quite a bit of laboratory activities going on. Uh, Dr. Lei Ming Zhang and Chris McClendon as well uh, in our group doing um, deposition modelling and satellite uh, retrievals. So I think you'll see this picture a number of times this afternoon and this is really the schematic that we have constructed to sort of describe the overall processes that we're, we're trying to understand, we're trying to model uh, piece by piece and ultimately to integrate it all together for the purpose of, of understanding current conditions and having the potential to look at scenarios into the future. And uh, in this case, uh, we see that we're you know, showing a large area there that is potential emissions into the atmosphere and then asking some key questions after the emissions about where they go, their transport, their transformation, what they're changing to as they move in the atmosphere, and then ultimately where are they depositing and what's depositing. Uh, so for this presentation, we're really going to focus on that latter part, just trying to get a better handle on contaminant deposition. And uh, there are many compounds that are emitted. Uh, we're going to stick to just a few of them here today. Largely, we're going to be talking about polycyclic aromatic compounds, PACs, uh, which we've broken into three classes that we're quantifying. So in this, in this uh, program, we've added some a little additional resolution to our chemical measurement of these PACs by adding, in addition to the, uh, the basic uh, suite of EPA-regulated pHs, 13 of them, but also adding to them a large suite of alkylated pHs that have uh, alkyl groups attached to these benzene rings, and also adding uh, to this uh, dibenzothiophenes, which have got a sulfur within the rings as well, to, to ask some more questions about the, the types of pHs that are out there, whether they can tell us about the source and possible toxicity of the mixtures that are in the air. There is also uh, um, efforts that are going on in this contaminant work to measure metals in the atmosphere. A large range of metals are being measured, uh, and also mercury, although in this presentation we're going to focus on the PACs. And we're trying to approach this from an integrated manner, trying to do the monitoring, collect the measurements, uh, use information on deposition to do the best we can to estimate deposition across the landscape, nearby and downwind, but also at the same time use the measurements to look backwards to gain insights into the emissions. Uh, perhaps we look at uh, um, the, the absolute quantities of, of um, uh, pollutants in measurements versus emissions, but often we look more at, at ratios of species and are the ratios of species that we're observing similar to what's reported in the emissions. So we try to work this sort of simple model in both directions to gain more insight. Now in uh, this presentation, as I mentioned, uh, we're talking quite a bit about deposition. So we're going to cover air monitoring, uh, precipitation sampling, total deposition calculations, which I'll cover, and, and then Jane is going to talk about snow sampling, sediment core work, and wrap it up. So the key questions that we're trying to answer in, in terms of the JOSM framework are what are the contaminant levels in the air, uh, where are they going nearby and farther downwind, how are they transforming, I mentioned these already, uh, where are they being deposited, and ultimately, certainly we want to link this to the doses we can predict through that to uh, research that's going on in the effects. And that leads to a number of different products that we're, we're striving to, to produce. Uh, spatial temporal trends, baseline concentrations, deposition models, uh, to have this predictive power so we're not looking just at today but we can look as oil sands development grows in various areas. Uh, and then clearly we want to link this fully through to the effects and ultimately use that for this key question, this so what question. And I guess I'm the unlucky one that has to give the first talk right after someone asks the big so what question. Uh, and there are certainly lots uh, that we need to do to to come right down to what are the key element, elements that are there. And in terms of management, you know, the research does take time and it informs an, an adaptive management approach as we go forward. We don't have all the answers now. We have to realize that management is an adaptive management. 
So the contaminants that we've been doing and that we've been measuring in the air, we started in 2010, largely through a lot of great collaboration with Wabia and setting up some, some samplers at three of their sites within the oil sands area nearby, and then also going out into the network that uh, Kevin mentioned that they have got their passive samplers at and some MET towers and some of the forest plots to bring in passive samplers for PACs to give us a spatial coverage. Uh, also at some of these sites we've added precipitation measurements and then uh, uh, Jane has been working with a group to do uh, surveys of snow and snowpack sampling and also groups that are doing some of the sediment cores to look at uh, long-term trends in the sediments, some of that we saw yesterday. We do want to link all this into models as I've mentioned already. So in terms of the atmospheric monitoring, this picture there on the right gives an idea of, of the region where the monitoring has taken place and the three points that are there just sort of uh, in, in amidst the uh, main oil sands surface mining area are the three surface stations where we have active samplers, high vol samplers, collecting samples on filters and downstream puffs to look at total quantities of, of packs. Uh, you can see a picture there of one of the samplers with a blue arrow pointing to it. Uh, and there are, are some sites that are at somewhat different distances, but really nearby. Uh, there are the passive samplers and at the other spots that aren't marked by the blue that cover a fairly wide net, but lots of gaps between them. And you can see there's sort of range of distance that we cover there up to 100 kilometers in some distances, but largely it's within 40 or 50 kilometers. Precipitation samplers uh, are there, are um, just shown there in the bottom, uh, and, or no, I guess they're in the middle, uh, the way there's a precipitation sample in the middle on the, on the right there, there's an arrow. Now, just to jump into some of the data to give you an idea of what's being observed, these are just the measurements of benzoate pyrene, which is one of the, the PAHs that's uh, most commonly looked at in terms of what, how standards are set. And this compound BAP has a standard set for an annual average concentration of 0.3. And uh, at the one site, Lower Camp, which is the one that's more in the midst of the surface mining activity, we've been observing concentrations over these two years of measurements that have been exceeding the standard, uh, or the, the objective at least, uh, for Alberta uh, fairly consistently. The other sites also within that region are being observed to be below that. Uh, one of the things we have to worry about when we measure BAP in some of these pHs is the effect of forest fires. So we have to go through the data and make sure that we're not including forest fire in these measurements. This image here is from the same site, the lower camp site, in amidst the measurements is to another one of the Wabia sites. And there are two plots here that I'm showing. And the main thing I want you to take away from this are the one, the dots are the active samples collected every sixth day. Uh, and the amount of variability that you see. So you can see that uh, in the pink or in the green, that from sample to sample, we're seeing one to two orders of magnitude variability in, the con in these 24-hour concentrations, which clearly depends on the meteorology and uh, where the upwind sources are at the time of the sampling. Another thing that I want you to take away from this plot is the bottom graph of the green, the standard PAHs that are typically most often measured, and the alkylated pHs that we brought into this program to look more at what's what uh, the particles and the gases are composed of, and we see that they're uh, 10 times higher than the other pHs. So we've, seen, we've shown that this is really a key thing to expand the suite of compounds that are being measured. Um, this image here shows now just across the passive sites, the levels as you go from nearby, which is sort of the, the sites labeled with the L, the near field sites are farther away. And like many have seen, and I don't plot a gradient plot here, I just plot the data, there are, there are higher levels closer and they drop off further away. Generally beyond 50 kilometers, they drop off to, to as best as we can tell right now, background. Uh, the highest is at lower camp L11. Now in comparison, we can see some background measurements from around the world, uh, coastal Ireland, the Great Lakes, uh, and where our data stand compared to that, or to some urban centers where we see that the, the measurements of these are below that, uh, to some other urban centers as well. Uh, so this gives you a perspective of these measurements to date. If we look at the alkylated pHs, we can see that there is um, higher levels, as I mentioned, nearby more persistence of higher levels. And if we compare that to really the limited data that exists out there for alkylated pHs, we can see that nearby we're in the, in the range of, of what's certainly known and thought to be a fairly polluted city, Los Angeles. Now the deposition work that we're doing is um, involving models that have been developed over a number of years that take into consideration 
the landscape in the area to compute deposition velocities. In the middle picture there is a, is a picture of deposition velocity estimates across a wide region. You can see Lake Athabasca up there in the upper right. Uh, we can then couple that with the air data, the passive air data, to multiply them together to get an estimate of the deposition flux. Uh, one of the challenges is that uh, this is a sort of an observational hybrid approach and where we can model deposition velocity through meteorological models everywhere we have very limited measurements of air concentration uh, and not really a lot of confidence to just interpolate that to say what it's like everywhere. Uh, we will be working on using certainly source-oriented models that uh, Heather Morrison will be talking about later in terms of the GEMMOC model and how we can cover the landscape through that approach. So just quickly a couple examples of deposition velocity and one of the things that we've been working on trying to develop better in the context of the Jossen program and that is to do the deposition of these packs and, and that's we're sending a challenge because depending on the compound, it'll have different properties, different uptake rates that we measure as centimeters per second. And we can see there uh, anthracene and fluoranthine gas phase deposition, and you can look at something like Lake Athabasca in the upper right, and the differences that are there depending on the compound. So we need to be able to resolve species to be able to accurately do the deposition to the landscape. Or in terms of particle size there on the right, we see PM 2.5, smaller than 2.5 micron particles or coarser particles, the different deposition rates there as well. So we need to resolve that uh, um, by gases, by particle size, and then by the landscape features. Uh, what is the type of vegetation cover? And you can see there in the boxes that are just downwind of the main oil sands area, the sort of differences that we observe. Now precipitation, just quickly, because I need to leave time for Jane, for sure. Precipitation, uh, we also have seen more of a seasonal pattern, probably that driven by precipitation amounts, but also a dominance of alkylated pHs and the measurements we've got at the three sites within the area. Uh, I mentioned the challenge that we have in filling in spatially. This map reminds us of where we've been measuring so far. So limited sites, largely within 50 kilometers. So we do need to start to develop other tools for that. And I just draw your attention to one, one tool that's giving us some idea of the spatial coverage of some types of pollutants, more that are combustion-related air pollutants uh, that would be related to NO2 or nitrogen dioxide. So this image here shows uh, that uh, there is up in the upper, upper right area a light blue area that we've been observing has been increasing in levels over the last number of years, this 2011, 2013 versus, say, earlier time periods prior to 2010. Uh, and those are areas that we don't really have the coverage now that we need to be able to work towards uh, filling in those gaps down the road. So uh, we'll, using all this information, integrating it with what the deposition measurements are, satellite data, and the air quality models that you'll learn about later. And there is a poster on satellite work in the poster room as well. Thank <laughs> okay, thanks Jeff. So as Jeff uh, said, I'm going to uh, talk about the snowpack work that we've been doing as well as the work with dated lake sediment cores um, as part of this program on atmospheric deposition. And one way we can kind of get around this um, issue of, of covering the entire space of, of the oil sands region is to use snowpack measurements for the wintertime deposition story anyways. Um, so one of the great things about snow is that if you sample the entire snowpack profile, um, you can get an idea of all of the contaminants that were deposited over the entire winter. And the second great thing about snow is that um, it's everywhere on the landscape. Um, so you can sample at a variety of different locations um, to uh, look at spatial patterns and deposition. Um, so we've been sampling snow for um, since 2011, um, and we began with just a small survey of the, of the original uh, 30 sites that were sampled by Dave Schindler and Aaron Kelly. Uh, and then we expanded the program to, to look at transects moving away from uh, a central location, or AR6, which is located uh, adjacent to the two uh, upgrading facilities and adjacent to some of the major developments. And then also um, sites in the Peace Athabasca Delta. And this, this is one way that we have been working with communities. Uh, we have had community involvement in these snow sampling um, campaigns since uh, 2012 with residents of Fort Chippewa. So um, from these, what we get when we take a snow sample uh, is that we, can, we melt the snow and then we also take measurements of snowpack density um, and we can determine the snow water equivalents. So we can calculate a 
um, wintertime loading in micrograms per meter squared, which um, is a deposition estimate for the entire winter. And we have sufficient coverage on the landscape, uh, landscape so that we are able to interpolate these uh, measurements and create these nice deposition maps. Um, so you can see that this, uh, this is for total uh, PAHs or total packs. And you can see this fairly classic bullseye pattern on the landscape. And um, deposition, deposition does drop off fairly rapidly um, out of the major development area. Um, to put these measurements in, in context, uh, as Jeff did with the air measurements, um, the loadings within a few kilometers of the major developments are similar to what we would see um, in more industrial areas of the lower Great Lakes, for example. And then loadings in the Peace Athabasca Delta, which is, of course, a couple hundred kilometers north of the major developments, are, are similar to what we would see in a remote U.S. National Park or the Austrian Alps, for example. Now, one thing, and uh, Jeff also mentioned this, the importance of measuring a, a fairly large suite of of packs, and we find this as well. Um, analysis of 52 packs or 52 different analytes captured 16% uh, more of the total uh, packs loading um, than measuring 39 analytes that Cho et al. measured a few years previously. So adding those extra analytes uh, does matter to, when you're considering deposition to the landscape. Now, this, uh, this presentation is focusing on uh, PACs, but I did want to bring in a little bit of the metals work that we um, have done. Here's a similar deposition map for vanadium, um, and here's another one for methylmercury. And if, this is, of course, the form of concern because it is the um, form that bioaccumulates and biomagnifies through food webs and um, is a uh, vertebrate neurotoxin. So we, that, we see that similar bull, uh, bullseye pattern for vanadium, methylmercury, the 13 uh, priority pollutant elements, or PPEs. We also see it for several crustal, uh, crustal elements as well. So the next thing that um, we, uh, one of the things that we can do with this data is that we can, uh, from these deposition maps, maps, we can calculate the quantity of, of a contaminant that's deposited within a certain area. So what we've done is in the uh, second column, we've calculated the quantity in kilograms or tons that is deposited to the area within 50 kilometers of the major development. So imagine, if you will, a 50 kilometer uh, uh, radius circle. Um, and then we've compared these deposition quantities to uh, emission estimates provided to NPRI. So that's the third column shows 2012 uh, emissions reported to NPRI for the oil sands region for 2012. And then we've simply weighted this for the an estimated winter emissions um, for 2012. And what we can see is that... Um, in, for some of these pollutants, such as PAX, vanadium, uh, zinc, and nickel, we see uh, uh, a large deposition over uh, the winter compared to what's reported to, M to NPRI for the entire year or what we would es estimate for winter 2012. Um, and what this suggests, of course, is that um, there are other important emissions than what is reported to NPRI. And of course, NPRI is not required to, um, to, uh, to report on all of these compounds, and they are meeting their uh, reporting requ requirements. Um, it just, these results just show that there are, are other important emissions, such as, few, uh, such as dusts from, for example, mining operations, um, vehicle emissions, tailings, volatilization, all those types of things are not um, reported on to the public currently. So um, we're starting to get a bit of a temporal picture now. We are able to get um, the original 2008 data from uh, Dave Schindler and Aaron Kelly. Um, and for the same sites and for the same analytes, we are able to compare um, 2008 and then 2011 and 2000 uh, to, to, to 2013 loadings. So I'm showing PAX loadings in snow on the y-axis and distance from those major developments on the x. 
Um, and you can see that there's obviously a similar trend um, each year. Um, and one, one thing that's interesting is that between 2008 and 2013, PAC's deposition has um, increased on average by about 16%. Um, and then deposition did increase um, between 2012 and 2013, but is still higher in 2013 than it was in, in 2008. Uh, another, uh, I think Colin Cook showed this uh, graphic yesterday, but I wanted to show it again. Um, here I'm showing something similar, but now I'm showing vanadium in snow, and also vanadium in lichen, and this is, of course, uh, data provided by Landis et al. Um, from Kevin Percy's, uh, it's in Kevin Percy's book. Um, and you can see the lichen and the snow are, are showing the, uh, a, a very similar trend in deposition. Um, so multimedia measurements are, are telling us a very similar story here. So just to finish up a couple minutes, I want to talk about the work that we've been doing on dated lake sediment cores. So how many people know what, how you would get a long-term temporal trend from looking at a sediment core? Nobody? <laughs> Couple? Okay, so I'm just going to briefly explain how these, how these things work. Um, basically, you go into uh, a, a lake, you want a simple sort of uh, system that it doesn't have a co very complex hydrology, and you get this core. And you can imagine, of course, that the sediment at the bottom of that core was deposited many, many years ago. But the sediment at the surface was just de de deposited in recent times. And then you, you slice this core into fine um, 0.5 centimeter increments. And then you analyze each of those slices for, um, you date it with lead 210 dating. And also you can analyze every slice for um, contaminants. So that, of course, is what we have done. And in the absence of any long-term monitoring data in this region, um, this is, these types of proxy measurements are really the only uh, way we're going to get an idea of background um, and, and changes since industrial developments began. So we've been coring five to six lakes per year. Um, so we're at about a count of 25 now. Here's uh, where they fall in the landscape. We started kind of near field or within 50 kilometers of the major developments and then slowly worked our way out. Um, and here's uh, some of the results. So here I'm showing PAH flux in nanograms per centimeter squared per year over time. And you can see that this is between around 1900 and present. Um, and what you can see, uh, I'm showing near field lakes, which are within 50 kilometers of the major developments, that's the red boxes, and far field, which are uh, 75 to 185 kilometers away. And so you can see in the near field lakes, there's a dramatic increase um, in pH flux beginning in around the, the 1960s. And total uh, PAX deposition is between one and 19 times higher um, after 1980 than before uh, development began. So here's similar graphs, but for um, some different groups of uh, PACs. So the PAHs, the alkylated PACs, and the dibenzothiophenes all show similar patterns. Um, as Jeff said, with air, the alkylated PACs do dominate um, in these sediments. Uh, dibenzothiophenes uh, are also um, showing a very um, sharp increase since industrialization. And then retine is on the bottom, and this is an indicator of biomass burning or forest fire. And you can see that it, of course, does not follow the same trends as these other PACs. So um, with that, I'm just going to give you some summary points and then take some questions if there's time. So. Um, I hope I've shown you, where we've shown you from this presentation, that um, we're gathering enhanced information on deposition of airborne contaminants and soil associated with oil sands activities um, through sampling of air, precipitation, snow, and lake sediment cores. Um, integration of these different measurements uh, and modeling tools are helping establish present day temporal and spatial variability and trends. Um, 
Additional speciation of PACs is providing a clear picture of the contribution of the oil sands activities. And I, I didn't get it, we didn't get a chance to get into some of the fingerprinting or source attribution work um, that we're doing, but it is, it's coming along. Um, current data indicates that deposition is close to background beyond the 50 to 70 kilometer mark. However, we really need to focus a little bit more in coming years uh, on more distant sites and sensitive methods um, so that we can really characterize what is background for this region, which is, sounds like an easy thing to do, but it's, it's really not. Um, more complete emission information is really needed, especially on these fugitive sources such as mining, tailings, uh, on and off roads, um, just land, land clearing results in dust. Those types of things are really needed so that we can reconcile our, uh, the emissions with the environmental measurements. Um, future work will involve continue, continuing um, assessment of ecosystem effects through an integrated approach to help ensure the environmentally sound development of this uh, resource. And uh, in this next coming year, we're hoping to really um, sit down and look at our data and look at the spatial coverage that we have put everything together and ensure that we make recommendations for future monitoring um, that are sufficient so that um, we can understand cumulative environmental effects associated with current and planned oil sands activities. And that's it. So there are times when Questions? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you guys the microphone so you can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jane and uh, Jeff. I just uh, I, I, uh, that's a very interesting presentation. I noticed the uh, several figures in the presentation. It's about the pH, the trend uh, like a flux trend uh, for pH. Um, uh, I think pH like a uh, organic pollutants is a little bit different from metals. It's it degradates. Uh, so I'm I'm thinking when you do the trend analysis, you better uh, take the back, like maybe like a biodegradation into consideration, then calibrate your result. Uh, but maybe not uh, uh, for metals. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I so I guess it depends on, on your question. If you're looking at neat net ecosystem uh, inputs of the contaminant, then sort of bef it doesn't really matter what the degradation was before it enters the ecosystem, right? If, you're, if you want to assess what the net ecosystem input is, say for my snow measurements at snow melt, then post-depositional processing of that contaminant really doesn't matter. So it really depends on what your question is. If you're interested in transport pathways and that sort of thing, then degradation post-depositional uh, and pre-depositional processing is important. So I guess it, it depends on what your question is um, on how carefully you have to look at degradation and in what compartment. Does yeah, that... Uh, my question... Um... And some metals do undergo post-depositional processing. For example, mercury does undergo photo reduction, and me uh, methyl mercury undergoes uh, photo degradation as well. So some metals, uh, they all react. They all act differently. You know. Yeah, that's true. Um, but for pH, like uh, once it's deposited into the lake sediment, it, I, uh, our research showed that there's a uh, degradations, uh, like for pH. I'm oh, so sure diagenesis that. within sediment cores, is that what you're... Yeah, the sediment cores, yeah. Right. That one, yeah. Um, um, okay, th uh, that's the first one. Uh, my second, uh, another question is, uh, I, let, I just uh, want to share the information with you. Uh, lately, I had a phone call with uh, Alberta Agriculture or Forestry. Um, uh, I just noticed the wind direction change in the season, like uh, in different seasons. Mm -hmm. like, uh, normally, we know the prevailing wind direction is from west to east, mm -hmm. but it's not the case like uh, in different seasons. Mm -hmm. Sometimes from south to north, sometimes from east to sure. west. Yeah. So when we do the snowpack uh, analysis, we probably need to take this uh, 
uh, into consideration? Sure. Yeah, we've yeah. we've done the wind analysis for sure. It's part of the, yeah. the package and for the modeling. I'm sure it's a big part of what goes into the model. And yeah, interestingly enough, um, when we looked at what we find in the snow, I can speak best to the snow stuff because that's what I um, work on specifically. Um, the wind direction and speed played a very small part in the deposition pattern and the quant and the quantity, well, the deposition pattern. So the wind, both speed and direction played a very small role in the deposition pattern that we see. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, just um, you know, going to the air. So in the air there is, uh, if, if I were to plot curves like what Jane showed for, for concentration versus distance, you would certainly see that there's points from the passive uh, sampling that are off this curve. Uh, and largely, that's partly because of the prevailing winds during these different two-month sampling periods. Okay, thank you. Uh, this one's mainly for Jeff. Um, I did have some questions about the passive. Oh. I did have some questions about the passive sampler, but maybe that's better taken offline. I just had a quick question about the results of the PAC uh, sampling that you did. So there's historically been a decent amount of just the high vol pH data, but with the passive, the new passive spatial resolution, uh, I, I guess what have you seen with the alkylated pHs and the benzodiethylene or uh, dibenzothiophenes? Um, are there any specific compounds that we're to start looking out for? Or have you seen anything that's uh, been interesting? Like, has there anything stood out with those results? Well. Um, you're largely asking the wrong person since uh, this has been the laboratory uh, group uh, that's been led by Tom Harner that's been looking at other compounds. Uh, and one of the things that they've been trying to extend their work to has been to look, actually look at the toxicity of the extract and get a sense of whether there's variations in the toxicity of the extract that are there some results I could share with you offline if you wanted to see some of that. But you know, I think the sort of real overarching thing that's been here so far has, has been the, you know, the much larger amount of alkylated PHs. Um, uh, uh, we have a new postdoc that's working on um, with Derek Muir on some identification of new PAX compounds. And so he's using some new fandangled approaches, the 2DGC ICPMS. And so he's able to identify some new novel um, PACs that haven't been um, identified in the oil sands previously. So that's work, that work is potentially interesting for sort of source, source attribution, which I think is what you were getting at some, yeah, if there's some marker of something, of different processes. So we are, we're, we're working in that direction for sure. Okay. Rob, oh, sorry, Rob. Sure, yeah, no, one Just more. Just a quick one here, and we can also defer this till maybe after Heather Morrison's talk later on. Oh. Um, I just want, wouldn't mind hearing a little bit more about the, your comment about needing more emissions information. So the um, question would be if are any of the industrial sites providing you real measured emitted data so that you can compare? So you're asking if industry has that data? If they have it and if they've provided it to you, have, do, have you reviewed that data? Um, I think they do have that data. Maybe there's somebody from industry here who can speak more to it. I don't know, but um, I think they do, and I think it's only a matter of time before we're able to sit down and, and get our hands on that. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a process to, to work together and come to agreements of sharing of information, but I, I have had some meetings with them that suggest that they do have it and they're there are people at the table who are willing to share it. So do you know if the NPRI emi um, estimated emission quanti quantities, if they've been based on actual measurement or on estimates? Um, I don't know if you were here yesterday for George Marson's presentation. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I think the picture is quite similar for the PACs as well. There, it really is quite variable as to how often those sorts of measurements have been taken and how they're turned into emission factors. Uh, and then certainly there are sources where there's less information available, such as the, as the tailings ponds, which the work of uh, Frank Vanya has pointed towards as being a, a possible source for some of the, the uh, um, gap between emissions and what we see in the, in the uh, passive samplers. Good. All right, great. Thank you very much. Round of applause there for those.